yesterday I was asked to give a talk for the Canadian League Against Epilepsy on the optimal use of routine EG, sleep EG and ambulatory EG and I decided to share a modified version of that presentation with you. So let's get started here. Now routine EG is any EEG that you do at the spot so you a patient does not have to be prepped for that, a person does not have to be sleep deprived and it's different from an ambulatory EG is because most of the routine EGs are done for 20 minutes to half an hour, sometimes extending it to one hour. I use routine EEGs as an extension of the neurological examination. So we get consulted in the intensive care units, on the hospital wards, somebody who is comatose or suspected of having metabolic encephalopathy. This gives you an, addition, an additional piece of information that can help you with the diagnosis and the management of patients. Conditions specifically like CJD, subacute sclerosing panencephalitis, anti and MDA encephalitis have some electrographic signatures, not pathognomic but highly suggestive of these conditions. And I'll show you some examples of these cases as well. I also use routine EG in assessment of patients suspected of having epilepsy. So somebody that I'm completely convinced has seizures, but I don't know the classification EG helps me classify whether these are focal onset seizures or generalized seizures. And then patients come to us or we get consulted in the hospitals and there is a concern whether this person has a non-convulsive seizure or not. So EEGs definitely provide you that information and help you with the management of this patient. Now, this is an EEG of a patient who was in his 60s and had rapidly progressive dementia. On clinical examination, the patient also had startled myoclonus. And if you look at this EEG carefully, you see these periodic discharges. So these discharges that occur every one second. So in the right clinical context, so the right clinical concept, uh, context is rapidly progressive dementia in somebody who also has imaging findings. So I'm not going to discuss the neuroimaging findings. That was another tutorial that you can look up for CJD. And if the patient has clinical findings suggestive of CJD and you get this EEG, it is very supportive of the diagnosis. Now let's move on to the next slide here. So this is another patient who presented with a seizure and on EEG we find these lateralized areas of slowing. So you see these, this area of slowing and there were sharp waves in the same distribution. So this is some, uh, so the a routine EEG now helps to lateralize the seizure onset, the focus where the seizure was. And on imaging, this particular patient probably had a meningioma but it could be any structural abnormality. So when you do a routine EEG and you find lateralized findings, whether those are whether that is slowing or whether those are epileptiform discharges, you can consider a structural abnormality and then correlate with neuroimaging. Now, this is another EEG. Somebody comes to you with a seizure and you do a CT scan and an MRI and that is normal. But right after the seizure, if you do an EEG, and you find lateralized slowing. So as in this case, you see slowing compared to the left hemisphere with the right hemisphere. Right hemisphere still has some well-formed rhythm. The left hemisphere shows almost a persistent slowing. So if you see persistent slowing lateralized or localized to one area, you can think of structural abnormality, but in the absence of a structural abnormality, you can consider a post-ictal slowing. So somebody had a seizure, the seizure is now over, but the area that generates the seizures can show slowing for quite some period of time. Now, when somebody has a seizure and you do an EEG right away, there is a higher chance of finding epilepsy form discharges. But if you wait for several days or several weeks, the yield of finding epilepsy form discharges after a single seizure goes down. Now let's talk about this case here, the next case. This is a 48-year-old man who presented to the emergency room and I was called in late in the evening saying that this patient was acting strange for the past three days. He did have a history of epilepsy but not taken any anti-epileptic drugs for several years. 
On my examination, he was able to tell the year, but not the month and the date. He was able to follow one step and two step commands, but had significant issues with his attention requiring frequent prompting. I, co- I watched him walk to the washroom and back again, and, and uh, I, I decided to request an urgent EG around 6 p.m. that day. Now, the thing to keep in mind is, if somebody did not know this patient, looking at this patient from a distance, you would not be able to say that there was anything that was wrong. Only the family members who, of course, live with the patient or who are around him more frequently, mentioned that this is not him. There was something that was different about him. He was acting very strange for the past three days. So an EG was done, and this is what we found. What you see here is uh, I've cut down the gain here. So what you see is a spike in waves in a generalized distribution. And basically, I gave him some ativan, and there was some attenuation of the spike in wave for a little while, but those came back. And you can see the subsequent EGs. And this is the spike in wave that was basically continuous for the 30 to 40 minutes. And he could speak during this time. He could walk during this time. This is a condition that is called spike and wave stupor. So patients appear stuporous, partially unaware. They may still be functioning, but not at their full capacity. I loaded this patient with intravenous valproic acid and his EEG completely normalized. And the next day, he sort of snapped out of a dream. He did not recall the past three days. And on valproic acid, his symptoms were uh, completely controlled. Now, what about sleep EG or sleep deprived EG? Now, sleep EG and sleep deprived EG are not exactly the same. Sleep EG is where you capture some sleep during the EG. The transition from wakefulness to sleep can help you identify epileptiform discharges because during that time, during that state, a lot of epileptiform discharges, whether those are from focal seizures or generalized seizures, start showing up. I use sleep-deprived EEG, so I do not completely deprive the patient of their sleep, but I may partially deprive patients of sleep. I use it mainly in classification of seizures where the seizure classification is still not clear and to optimize medications for those patients. I find that high uh, that sleep-deprived EEGs have a very high yield in patients with generalized epilepsies. I would recommend not completely sleep depriving patients who have an established diagnosis of generalized epilepsy, specifically when seizures are controlled and they are taking medications because because significant sleep deprivation in patients with generalized epilepsy can in fact provoke a seizure. This is an EEG. So on a sleep deprived EEG, we found these generalized spike and wave discharges. And once you see this, it helps you direct uh, towards the best medication for this patient. Now, briefly touching on ambulatory EEG. So ambulatory EEGs are done in our lab. We bring the patients in, we connect them to the uh, EEG, and they go home with the monitor. So we record it for 24 hours. In rare instances, I've recorded it for 48 or 72 hours as well. Ambulatory EEGs, I find, increases the yield of identifying epileptiform discharges. These can capture seizures in patients living alone. So I've had patients come in who have not been witness to seizures and they are not and they are not aware of their unawareness. So for that reason, ambulatory EEG is just like a witness that provides additional information. And then there are patients, specifically younger individuals or kids, who have certain behaviors that the parents are concerned about. So ambulatory EG in these instances can help classify the behaviors that are very frequent and suspicious of epileptic seizures. The parents can keep a note of all those episodes or at what times those happen during the EG and the epileptologist or the electroencephalographer can go back at those spots to see if there were any electrographic seizures or not. I'm not going to go into a lot of details about the sensitivity and specificity of those different modalities. You can look it up in the literature. So let me give you an example here. PM was a 24-year-old student at University of Alberta. He had a right temporal lesion. 
In the past, he was known to have focal unaware seizures, which were at that time called complex partial seizures. He reported being seizure-free for the past few years and wanted to drive. Since he worked mostly on his own in the lab and lived alone at home, I decided to request a 24-hour ambulatory EG to get a better sampling. Now the EEG revealed an electrographic seizure within the first 18 hours lasting 40 seconds. So this is what we had. This is, was his ambulatory EEG. And you can see clearly the onset of the seizure from the right temporal head region. This is continuation of that EEG. And this is another page on this EEG. And this is the last page. So this is where the seizure ends. You can see that the seizure ends. There is not much muscle or movement artifact here and the electrographic seizure is no longer visible. So that is something to keep in mind that ambulatory EG can provide information and is very useful in people who are living alone and people where there are no witnesses to say whether they are still having seizures or not. This is another sample of an EG from a different patient. Uh, routine EG and sleep deprived EG had not shown any abnormality on our, and on ambulatory EG we were able to see generalized spike and wave which helped in the management of this patient by choosing the right medications. This is yet another example of a patient who was experiencing a lot of falls and bruises at home, used to live by himself and on EEG I was able to capture multiple seizures and the patient was started on the appropriate medications. So in summary, routine EEG serves as an extension of the neurological examination and is useful in both epileptic and non-epileptic conditions. One of the main role of sleep EEG and sleep deprived EEG is to increase the chance of finding epileptic form discharges as well as classification of the seizures. And I find that ambulatory EG plays an important role in quantifying seizures and identifying seizures in people who live alone. It is very helpful in differentiating epileptic from non-epileptic episodes. And finally, it provides a large sample of EG. Therefore, it increases the yield when looking for epileptic form discharges. I will end my tutorial here, but I ask my audience to kindly share in the comments what are the indications for EEG in your lab? If you've requested EEGs, in what indications do you request routine EEG, sleep-deprived EEG, and ambulatory EEG? And if you are a technologist, I'm sure you have a wealth of information. Kindly share what are the conditions, what are the different indications that you've seen in your practice. Thank you so much.